So in the late 1880s, a gentleman by the name of John Montgomery uh, was credited with the first American to fly a glider uh, here in San Diego. He was actually the first glider pilot in America. And he flew at a location south of here by about 20 miles, closer to the Mexican border. When the westerly wind hits this cliff, it generates a tremendous upcurrent, uh, especially in the winter months when we have a lot of wind come through here on the Pacific storms. Uh, sometimes the wind can get up to 30 knots or 40 knots, and it's just a tremendous uh, vertical rise that comes through here. It goes up very, very high, and it's uh, recognized for that sort of natural geography that makes this place so special. It's kind of like Waimea or Pipeline would be for surfing. This would be a recognized place for gliding, simply because of this geography that makes it special. And we can walk out here and see it. Just hope there's no earthquake. So, again, nice shot of the pelican down there in the waves. So again, this is about a 330-foot drop. And the mountain to the, to the left there is Mount Soledad. That's where Charles Lindbergh would have taken off in 1930. And soared along these cliffs in a large bowl of sail plane, 60-foot wingspan and then gone all the way down the cliffs around this point and landed at where the next point is, uh, near the city of Delmar, on the beach. He went so far that the people that were on the mountain watching him did, you know, disappeared from view and they were afraid that he would have crashed. So they came roaring down the mountain in their cars and looking all over for him and finally found him on the beach taking apart the, the glider on his own. There was a group of of students from local San Diego high schools, uh, namely San Diego High School and La Jolla High School, that built their own gliders in the woodshop class at the school. And the, in, the instructor for the woodshop class would go out to a hill, test the glider that they just built, and then invite all, any student they wanted to just go fly it. It's yours. You built it. And so those kids would bring those gliders to the beach. Uh, just on the other side of this, this point, there's a nice flat beach like the one that's here. They would bring the, the glider onto the beach, pull a car onto the beach, spread a rope between the car and the, and the glider, and then tape the glider up with the car towing it, and then release the rope, and then fly up and down the cliffs all the afternoon while the wind was going, and then they land back down on the beach, pack it up, and that was their fun. And they used to do that through the 1930s, early 1930s to about 1933 or so. And people on the beach weren't all that happy with it because the fishermen were there and there's these gliders flying around and it wasn't the right place to do it. So they got smart and they recognized why are we doing it on the beach? We can just come up to the top and launch right off the top and land back on the top and that's good. So in about 1936 or so, in 35, 36, was the first recorded use of the glider port on the top up here for launching and landing of sailplanes by a man. Uh, na a man named Woody Brown was the first to do that. He was also a very famous local surfer here in San Diego who did both surfing and soaring. Uh, uh, he lived to be 98, just passed away in Hawaii just last year. Uh, he surfed till he was 86 or 87. Tremendous man. Um, through the 1940s, other gentlemen like Paul McCready, uh, John Robinson, Bill Ivins, uh, people who were very famous in soaring and ended up having tremendous careers in aviation, flew out here in, San, in, in Torrey, at Torrey Pines in sailplanes at the contests that were held here or just for fun. So Paul McCready came out here many times and flew sailplanes. Lots of different aeronautics designs following World War II here in, in San Diego. Each of those had their own group of aviation-minded people, uh, not only flying sailplanes in them, but also interested in ham radio and operating RC equipment. And so it was natural for them then to come to the Torrey Pines Glider Port to test their ham radio in their glider designs to see how well they could perform relative to the big guys that were flying the sailplanes out here regularly. And so in about 1950, 1953, were the first people that came out of Ryan Aircraft with ham radio operated sailplanes out here at Torrey Pines, single channel escapement uh, systems that would fly up and down here with just a rudder control and then hopefully you don't crash in the landing and you can do it again. Uh, one of the better flights from that period in the 50s was a flight by a Dr. Bob Chase, who in 1956 was the first to fly a RC sailplane uh, for over eight hours. He flew here eight and a half hours at Torrey Pines, setting a world record in 1956. And it's not, it's not a coincidence now that um, there are 
groups like the League of Silent Flight, which is a SIG of AMA, one of their criteria for quality or advancement achievement in their LSF advancement to levels is an eight hour flight with a sail point on the slope. So he really kind of set the bar, and that first eight hour flight by anyone in the world's history in an RC, with an RC sail plane was here at Torrey Pines. So this is the setup area for the hang gliders. Uh, there's like, some tie downs in the area, and they, they land generally in this direction, coming into the wind on the grass here. Uh, paragliders as well. So it's a big uh, ultralight facility, uh, recognized in the ultralight community as a sort of mecca for their aircraft as well. And I'll explain that history in just a second. But the sailplanes that have operated here since the 1930s um, have used a runway that goes back towards the trees. There's now a big building in the back behind the trees. But you can see the eucalyptus trees that are just in front of that building. And if you look carefully, there's a paved runway. It's, de it's deteriorating now that comes off that hill. And that runway comes all the way up here towards this cone. So what they do is they set up a winch at this cone, just to the, just to the side of this cone. That winch has a very, very long spectra cable, spectra line, that goes back to a glider at those trees. The winch has a V8 motor, and they rev that motor in at like 60 miles an hour. So you go zero to 60 really, really quickly, and you're off the ground in 10 feet, and then you go up on the winch like you're reeling in a kite, and come in over about where we are here, you drop the cable, winch reels it in, and then you're free to fly up and down the coastline. There's about four and a half miles of cliff, and when the wind's good, you can stay up as long as the wind's there, because that inverted waterfall isn't going away. When you're ready to land then in a sailplane, a manned sailplane, typically you, you come out to sea, make a big 270, and come right back in downwind, and land on the side of this, uh, this asphalt runway, putting your nose into the ground with your skid to stop before you hit the trees. And that's, that's actually not, not as dangerous as it sounds. Another, if it's a high wind day, you'll come in over the Salk Institute, which is this building over here, where the polio vaccine was found, and make a left-hand turn, come in on the side of that bigger building, and come in and land upwind. And this area, this dirt uh, road that goes up that way, that's the emergency landing area if there's some kind of winch break or some problem and you don't have the altitude to go off the cliff, they make a right-hand turn and they land down there. And that operation has been continuing regularly like that since 1936, annually. Okay, so there's uh, two areas here. There's a, an area on the, on the left between these two cones. That's kind of where the hang gliders and the paragliders launch their equipment. And generally, if it's a larger sailplane, a model sailplane will launch there as well. It's a, it's a nice drop off and a safe, safe uh, clear drop to the, to the lift below. There's another area down here, which is a model airplane launching area too for sailplanes. You just stand at the edge and you throw your glider off into the, the, the big wind that's going up. And in fact, if you stick your hand out on a good day, you can feel the wind coming up. It's not that, not that, uh, not that uh, unobvious that your plane's going to go up into the wind. So you just stand and give it a good heave, and up you go. And it just goes up, and you can fly right along as a sailplane would, back and forth. And our landing zone is behind the hill on the other side, where we were standing just a minute ago. There's a nice uh, little carpet runway we have for the gliders, model gliders. And we land there and make a similar kind of approach as the manned sailplanes. So uh, here we are at the, uh, the pin board for the, the RC soaring operations at the glider port. And uh, this pin board's been here for years. It's been redone and it has all the, the frequencies, also ham radio operating. Uh, but more importantly, it has this plaque at the top, which dedicates this site as the first model aviation landmark in America. And my father, Larry Fogel, and I were the ones that worked with Rich Hansen to get that done. Uh, we also have the regulations here about uh, how to operate at the facility, uh, how to check in and and fly safely with the other types of operations that go on out here so it's all coordinated in a safe and effective manner. And also uh, here in the pit area, uh, this is where we set up the sailplanes and keep them when we're out ready to fly. Um, just different types of aircraft. There could be all sorts of different types of RC soaring out here. Today we have a lot of scale representation, but also there's aerobatic types, there's flying wings, there's uh, training gliders, there's all sorts of different types that can fly here whenever the wind's blowing. Unfortunately today the wind's not blowing, but, uh, but it's been a privilege to have AMA come here and video videotape this uh, incredible location for RC soaring. <laughs>